there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. with us on a musical journey through some of the most magnificent places on earth. Great towns and cities of Europe, steeped in history and beauty, and resounding with the stories and music of the world's greatest composers. Debussy, Rossini, Chopin, Elgar, Rachmaninoff. Just some of the greats in our classical destinations. Hello, I'm Simon Callow. Welcome to Classical Destinations and the very epitome of England's green and pleasant land. The Cotswolds gave birth to two of England's most significant composers of the 20th century and among its most innovative and original, Gustav Holst and Rafe Vaughan Williams. I'm in the very pretty town of Cheltenham today. Here, Gustav Holst was born in 1874, and just two years earlier, not very far south from here, in the village of Down Apney, Rafe Vaughan Williams was born. The two men met at the Royal College of Music and became fast friends. Situated on the edge of the beautiful Cotswolds, Cheltenham started out as a humble market town, but by the end of the 18th century, it was one of the smartest health resorts in England. So grand as its Regency period Main Street, it was named the Promenade. Cheltenham's other claim to fame is that it's the home of the steeplechase horse racing, and its racetrack is one of the most famous in England. Mind you, Holst wasn't the only famous person born here. It was also the hometown of the British Antarctic explorer Edward Wilson, born just two years earlier. The ancestry of Gustav Holst may have been Russian and Swedish, but he was an English composer through and through. He loved the rolling Cotswold countryside. As a struggling young musician, he happily walked between his teaching jobs and on Sundays to the village of Wick Rissington, where he played the church organ. Walking alone was one of Holst's great pleasures throughout his life. Even when he eventually achieved success and financial security, he still loved to walk. Not a sweaty power walk for exercise, but a slow and meditative ramble, to use the English word, lost in his surroundings. Walking provided Holst with both solitude and a deep spiritual connection with nature, and it undoubtedly helped him in his exploration of English folk music, the passion he shared with Vaughan Williams. So spirituality, the rhythms of nature, and traditional English music all played their part in the compositions of Gustav Holst. He struggled with frailty and poor health for much of his life, but his music soared into other worlds, into the solar system, and beyond. Holst and his family left this very charming suburban house in Pitville, near Cheltenham, when he was eight, when his mother died. But since then, it's become a museum, and it gives a wonderfully good impression of what it was like to be a, a young English boy in the 1870s, growing up in these nice regional surroundings. But some of the items in the museum are from other periods of his life, including this piano, at which he composed a great deal of his famous orchestral suite the planets, which will make him, I suppose, forever immortal. Um, and here on the piano is a piece of sheet music that he was working on. It's a folk song. I love my love because I know my love loves me. Andante moderato.
And here it is, the room in which Gustav Holst was almost certainly born in 1874, an absolutely typical little middle-class Victorian room, warm, cosy, comfortable, mundane. Extraordinary to think of so many exotic worlds of the imagination coming out of the child who was born in this room. And here we are in the front room, the music room, decorated in the style of the 1830s, the period at which Holst's family came to England for the first time. They came from Russia, though they were of German origin. And this, in fact, is his grandfather, Gustavus, after whom he was named, painted in Russia. Also a composer like Holst, who composed music for the harp, particularly. And here on the table are some of the reading matter with which Holst himself occupied himself, the uh, textbook of astrology, the sort of thing that, of course, led to the planet suite. And here, some of the Sanskrit texts, to learn which and to read which, in the original language, he learned Sanskrit. A typical quotation from the Upanishads. The future is never revealed to the fool, unmindful, wealth, glamour befooled. This world is the one, and beyond there is none. With such a conceit, he into my power comes over and over again. Holst the mystic. Although immensely talented musically as a child, Holst had to work very hard to turn his gifts into a career. When he was at the Royal College of Music, he busked to help make ends meet. And to save money, he'd cycle home to Cheltenham at the end of each term, a journey of over 120 kilometers. Even after he was married and living in London, Holst still had to spend long periods away from home, taking whatever jobs he could find, playing the trombone, the instrument he'd taken up to help his asthma. His compositions were constantly rejected by publishers and things were in fact getting desperate. Holst was ready to give up music altogether, but then his good friend Rafe Vaughan Williams recommended him for a teaching post. This was the turning point in Holst's life. He was a gifted and dedicated teacher and it brought the degree of financial security he needed to really concentrate on his composing. He never looked back. Teaching became a huge part of Holst's life. He worked with both children and adults, driven by his profound belief that music should be accessible to everyone. In 1905, he was appointed the music director at the St. Paul's Girls' School in London, and he held this post until his death in 1936. He was greatly revered, both by his students and his employers. When the St. Paul's School built a new music wing, it included a soundproof studio, especially for him, where he could compose. Holst thanked the school with his St. Paul's suite. And here, the emerging artists of the Australian Chamber Orchestra performed part of the second movement, Ostinato. Now a little more financially secure, in 1908, Holst and his wife Isabel moved into this house on Barnes Terrace in the picturesque London borough of Richmond. The River Thames is close by, so there were places for Holst to walk and meditate, although he still liked to escape into the countryside on weekends. Holst is forever associated with the pretty little Essex village of Thaxted. He first came here in 1914 purchasing a cottage as a refuge from the exhaustingly busy life of composing and teaching that he'd built for himself in London. Here, Holst relaxed, took long walks, and his creative batteries recharged, began work on his masterpiece, The Planet Suite. In Thaxton, Holst discovered something else that greatly excited him, the parish church. It wasn't like any other English parish church, no, more like a scaled-down cathedral inspiring but still intimate. It would, Holst thought, make the perfect venue for a music festival. Thaxted has 14th century royal patronage to thank for its uncommonly large parish church. 
and the use of plain glass in its windows makes the interior seem even more spacious. Holst's vision for a music festival was realized in 1916. It eventually outgrew the church, but a new event, commenced in 1987, now fills Thaxted with classical music every Whitsuntide weekend. Holst wrote a great deal of music in many, many different forms, but no doubt it is for the planets that he'll always be remembered. It was written in 1916 and first performed in 1918, in other words, towards the end of the First World War. And the first movement, Mars, gives a terrifying portrait of modern warfare. It's essentially a collection of seven linked tone poems, each with an astrological theme, obviously. And it's remarkable for the absolute confidence of the orchestral writing, a an amazing command of the possibilities of the modern orchestra, influenced by many of his great contemporaries, Stravinsky perhaps a little bit, Debussy and so on, but speaking absolutely its own language. And audiences in 1918 were especially astonished by the final movement, Neptune, using an off-stage women's chorus, which just slowly ebbed away. This was regarded as the acme of modern music, and here it was, written by a British composer. The Planets was an instant success, and for the first time in his life, Holst was actually wealthy. His health remained poor, though, and at the start of the First World War, he was declared unfit for military service. But Holst was desperate to do something to help. Even his wife was driving an ambulance. Eventually, the YMCA offered him the post of music director in the Middle East, teaching music to soldiers. After the war, Holst took on more teaching duties, including at the Royal College of Music, and he spent the weekends composing. It was a punishing workload, and it took its toll on his health. In 1924, and on doctor's orders, Holst returned to Thaxted to recuperate. But there would be no more masterpieces. Outwardly, Holst was shy, modest, very quiet. Mentally, his scope was vast. He was interested in all sorts of systems of thought, religion, psychology, astrology, alchemy, and he studied them in great depth. When he became fascinated by Hindu mythology, for example, he learned Sanskrit, an immensely difficult language to master, and wrote wonderful settings of the Rig Veda hymns, 
also he wrote in his masterpiece, The Hymn of Jesus, something of the ecstatic religious experience of the early Christians. But he detested the publicity and success that came to him with the planets. His idea of paradise was to cycle off either into the English countryside or, for example, in North Africa, into the Sahara to track down folk music. He was inward and private and essentially very modest. Quiet and modest man, though he was, Holst was a genius, for all that, with a unique form of expression. As you can hear, when the Australian Chamber Orchestra emerging artists play the extraordinary and exuberant Dargasson, the final movement of the St. Paul's Suite. You might perhaps have recognized the tune. It was, of course, also used by Ray Form Williams in his Fantasia on Greensleeves, and it's one of the oldest folk tunes known to us, just like the ones that Vaughan Williams and Holst discovered on their joint expeditions into the English countryside. Ray Fawn Williams was born in 1872 in rural Gloucestershire. He was a very bright child, brought up by his mother. His father died when he was very young. Uh, he eventually went to Trinity College in Cambridge and finished his musical studies in England at the Royal College of Music. He then went to Germany to study with the great composer Max Bruch, whose violin concerto is so well loved, and uh, Maurice Ravel. So there was nothing insular about Vaughan Williams. He was an extremely sophisticated composer. And uh, uh, the fact that he chose to root his music in the folk music of his own country by no means means that he was lacking in ambition of any kind. Vaughan Williams came from a very distinguished family and was related on his mother's side, both to the famous English potter, Josiah Wedgwood, and the evolutionist, Charles Darwin. His father was the local vicar here in the Cotswold village of Down Ampney, and the house where he was born in is still the vicarage. Vaughan Williams wasn't here for long, but he never forgot his birthplace, naming one of his most famous hymn tunes after it. And at the charming 13th century church where he was baptized, there's a fascinating permanent display dedicated to the composer's life and music. Down Ampney is in every sense the classic English village, and it's easy to see how it would have left an impression on the small boy destined to be one of England's greatest 20th century composers. Like Holst, though, Vaughan Williams was also something of a slow starter in music, and in fact he was 30 before he achieved any real success. And then there was no stopping him, and he was not only hugely prolific in his output, but achieved just about every accolade England could give him. His really big break came in 1904, when, still largely an unknown, he was invited to edit the English hymnal. 
Despite being a vicar's son, Vaughan Williams cheerfully described himself as a Christian agnostic, but nevertheless, he took the job of producing a creditable rival to the long-established Hymns Ancient and Modern. It was a huge project which took two years. One of the tunes that he rearranged was a melody by the 16th century English composer Thomas Tallis. And this it was that really made the music world sit up and take notice of Rafe Vaughan Williams. The Fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis is still one of his most popular works. Just about anywhere in the Christian world on a Sunday, there's a very good chance of hearing a Vaughan Williams hymn tune an enduring musical legacy indeed. He was also a committed socialist who refused a knighthood, but still wrote stirring music for two coronations, the festival Te Deum for George VI and the old 100th Psalm tune for Queen Elizabeth II. Vaughan Williams was also a master of writing film music and enjoyed a long association with the famous Ealing Studios. His best film music, perhaps, was for the 1948 film Scott of the Antarctic, which was just too good to be a soundtrack, and he reworked it later to become his Symphony No. 7, Symphonia Antarctica. Vaughan Williams lived to a, a great and productive old age. He was 85 when he died, still in harness, still writing remarkable, imaginative, but always communicative music. But the piece for which he's probably best known nowadays was called The Lark Ascending for violin and small orchestra, written just before the First World War. And in some kinds of ways, it seems to summon up that idyllic world which was swept away so completely by that terrible war. It's prefaced by a rather beautiful poem by George Meredith, of which this is the beginning. He rises and begins to round. He drops the silver chain of sound of many links without a break in chirrup, whistle, slur, and shake. Gustav Holst and Rafe Vaughan Williams represent an important period in English classical music. Through their revival of long-forgotten traditional tunes and the sheer innovations of their own composing, they gave England a unique voice which was able to make itself heard among all the others being raised across Europe. And here is Vaughan Williams's grave in Westminster Abbey's North Choir Isle. Here he takes his rightful place alongside three of the other hugely significant forces in English classical music, Purcell, Handel and Elgar. The inspiration that he drew from England's great composers of the past, from its folk music and from its countryside, exemplified in pieces like The Lark, Ascending, Rafe Vaughan Williams has fair claim to be considered the most English of all English composers. Next classical destinations is heading across the English Channel to France, where another larger-than-life composer, Camille Saint-Saëns, had a profound effect on his country's music. For now, though, from me, Simon Callow, it's goodbye.